Hello, everybody. For those of you following the course, welcome to week five of uh, Socratic Med's 15-week MCAT program supplement. Um, today, we are going to be talking about one of the two lectures we're talking about today um, is going to be structures of the eukaryotic cell. And my name is Chris. Um, so for those of you who are don't for those of you who don't know, uh, we are Socratic Med, um, and we are a grassroots nonprofit that provides sensible solutions to students with disparate medical school opportunities. Um, and there are a bunch of ways that you can get in touch with us. Um, we offer, you know, one-on-one -on -one tutoring. We have a bunch of different coursework um, that we post on YouTube. It's on our website. Um, we have an Instagram. Uh, our handle is right below at Socratic Med underscore. Um, you could, like I said, you could go to the website directly. Um, you can add yourself to the group me as well. That's one of the main ways that we reach out to students. Um, but at the bottom as well, you could just look at that link tree and there'll probably be a bunch of other links for you um, to click as well, including um, a Calendly sign up for office hours. We have uh, some tutors that work for Socratic Med, which also do um, private office hours and 30 minute intervals. So if you're interested in that, um, anything that happens in the video today, or if you have any questions in general, uh, you can definitely give that link a click and you can sign up. And everything um, that we offer is completely free. Um, so on a more personal note, my name is Chris. I graduated from Stony Brook University um, in May of 2019 on a pre-med track with a Bachelor of Science in Applied Math and Statistics. Um, I took the MCAT about two years later in April of 2021, and I scored a 520, which was that test's 97th percentile. Um, and I did get a perfect score on the psychology and sociology section. Um, so my tutoring specialty is in biology, psychology, and sociology. So uh, we'll start <clears throat> just by talking a little bit about the cell membrane, um, its structure, um, and what it functions as. So in eukaryotes, the cell membrane, also known as the plasma membrane, uh, is comprised of a phospholipid bilayer with other lipids and proteins situated around and integrated into the bilayer. Um, so bilayer, obviously, we have two layers that are on top of each other, um, and it's created of phospholipids, which are a little different than the triacylglycerols or triglycerides that we've been learning about, um, which we will talk about as well. Um, so the membrane's primary function is to regulate the entry of materials into the cell. Um, the eukaryotic cell membrane is considered semi-permeable because it is selective uh, as to what may enter. So generally, only small nonpolar molecules can diffuse through the membrane without the help of a membrane protein. So any larger, any uh, larger molecule or any polar molecule can't really get through that membrane too well just because of that uh, hydrophobic domain that we have in between the lipid bilayer. Um, there are, however, ways that we can get these large protein molecules through uh, that lipid bilayer, and we use uh, a number of different proteins, transporters, channels that are in the membrane, integrated into the membrane that help. Um, so that all of that is what combines and gives, uh, you know, the cell membrane its sort of semi-permeable characteristic. Um, okay, so a closer look at the phospholipid bilayer, you could look at the right. Um, <clears throat> right here, the extracellular and intracellular, um, these would just be the environments regarding the cell on either side of the cell membrane, and you could see how they're situated uh, with those hydrophobic tails inside and those heads outside. So a phospholipid is a lipid that is comprised of two fatty acids, uh, chain tails, and a polar phosphate head group attached to a glycerol molecule. Um, and think about triacylglycerols. So when we were learning about that, um, triglycerides, we have that choline group, uh, that head group, and then there are three fatty acids that are attached to that choline group. So we still have those three bonding domains, um, but in the phospholipid bilayer, two of them are, only two of them are taken up by fatty acids, and that third one is actually attached uh, to a phosphate group. Um, uh, and yeah, so that's how we get uh, these phospholipids that make up uh, the cell membrane. So the cell membrane consists of two back-to-back -back phospholipid bilayers, arranged with their hydrophobic tails pointing inward and their hydrophilic heads pointing outward. Why is this? Um, if you're not sure, it's really just, uh, it has to do with energetics. Um, shielding energetics. Uh, the hydrophobic groups are obviously going to congeal and they're going to um, congregate together. Um, and most of the extracellular environment and the intracellular environment um, it's aqueous and uh, it's charged. So these, these uh, phosphate head groups are gonna be pointing outward. Um, <clears throat> sort of like when we were learning about hydration shells and um, how hydrophobic materials will act in an aqueous environment or in a, um, a hydrophilic environment. Um, so we're basically minimizing the, um, the surface area of these two 
these two surfaces touching each other, these hydrophobic and hydrophilic surfaces. And in order to do that, um, this is the most energetically efficient form um, that takes place. The large hydrophobic interior created by the phospholipid tails prevents polar molecules from entering the cell, like we said before. Those large molecules and those polar molecules are not going to be able to pass through that hydrophobic tail, the, uh, those two layers of hydro hydrophobic tails. Um, so they have a more difficult time getting into the cell. So the fluid mosaic model describes the membrane as a fluid mixture of phospholipids, cholesterol, and proteins. Um, so if you know what a mosaic is, a fluid mosaic, you can just think about all of these um, all these different components sort of just bobbing around in sort of an ocean of phospholipids and cholesterols, and they're just sort of bopping around, um, bumping into neck, bumping into each other. Um, and obviously that fluidity changes um, with temperature, for example. Um, colder temperatures, the fluidity of the cell membrane might go down, and in higher temperatures, the fluidity is going to go up, and that can affect um, a lot of the regular functioning of the cell. So cholesterol helps maintain the structure in extreme temperatures. So in really cold temperatures, um, cholesterol actually manages to keep the cell membrane more fluid. And in higher temperatures, it actually manages to keep the cell membrane a little bit more rigid. Um, so we'll take a quick look at some of the membrane proteins that you find um, inside the membrane. Proteins found in the plasma membrane can be either integral or peripheral. So integral proteins are integrated through the entire membrane and reach both sides. Uh, they can act as receptors, transporters, channels, enzymes. Um, peripheral proteins are only exposed on one side of the membrane, and they may act as enzymes, carriers, or anchoring proteins. Um, so remember, peripheral proteins can't really be transporters or channels because they're only touching one side of the membrane. The whole point of a transporter um, usually would be to use ATP or some sort of energy to move um, some sort of substance, usually against its concentration gradient, and then channels are just an open channel where um, a substance can flow down its concentration gradient. Um, and we can't do that with peripheral proteins because there's no connection between the internal and external environment. So keep in mind uh, that while many surface receptors are used to pick up hormones from the bloodstream, cells may also use these proteins to communicate with surrounding cells. So I just added that, um, just to give you an idea of the diversity of proteins, they're not just all um, transporters or channels. Um, some proteins do have enzymatic activities on the front. Some are used as um, receptors. And some even have proteins that are sticking out that can be used as ligands for the receptors of other cells. Um, that's one of the ways that cells interact with each other. Um, they may also have receptors um, for paracrine signaling from surrounding cells. They may release some sort of um, ligand that the cell may, um, that the cell can use to start some sort of signal cascade from a, from a close cell. Um, that's, that's what we call paracrine signaling. Okay, we're gonna, this takes us to the first uh, review question. So which of the following substances would most likely be able to diffuse through the plasma membrane without the help of a transporter protein? So think about everything we were just talking about, your knowledge of everything below. Um, take about a minute. I would pause the video because I'm gonna go over the answer in about five seconds. Okay, so which of the following substances would most likely be able to diffuse through the plasma membrane without the help of a transporter protein? So the correct answer would be D, carbon dioxide, um, and let's take a look at it. So A, inorganic phosphate. Um, if you remember inorganic phosphate from biochemistry or orgo or any biology at this point, um, it's a pretty big polar, mo it's uh, not huge, but it's a polar molecule, and that's the most important part. Um, it's not going to be able to get through that hydrophobic uh, tail region of the lipid bilayer. So inorganic phosphate most likely would need some sort of protein uh, to get through. Uh, serine, the same thing. Uh, serine is an amino acid, and it's also, it has a hydroxyl group on its, um, like on its R group. Uh, so it is pretty polar, and again, it would have trouble getting through that hydrophobic domain. Palminic acid, uh, same thing. It's an acid. It's polar. It's pretty big. Uh, 16 carbon chain, if you remember, um, and uh, some it's it's difficult to get through the plasma membrane because it's big. Um, but D, carbon dioxide, is the best answer because it is the smallest uh, nonpolar molecule, and often carbon dioxide does diffuse simply in and out of the plasma membrane. So D would be the correct answer for this question. All right, we're flying through this. We don't have too much. Um, too much content to cover today. 
Um, so we're just going to talk a little bit about the cytoskeleton, the extracellular matrix, um, and then at the end, really quickly, we're just going to review some of the, um, the highest yield organelles that you would find um, pertaining to eukaryotic cells. Okay, so um, one of the three filaments that we're going to talk about um, are microtubules, the other two are microfilaments and intermediate filaments. So microtubules are the largest structures in the cytoskeleton. Um, all three of these filaments are part of the cytoskeleton. Microtubules are the largest. Um, they're hollow protein tubes made of smaller polymerized proteins known as alpha tubulin and beta tubulin. Um, so if you look at this picture, you could see this microtubule is hollow. Um, alpha and beta tubulin will dimerize and then um, take on this sort of helical structure. Um, and that's basically how uh, microtubules uh, polymerize. And that's how microtubules grow. Um, uh, Right, so if you see the third bullet point, since microtubules are constantly polymerizing and depolymerizing, they are said to be in a state of dynamic equilibrium. Um, so that is constitutive, it's constant. They are constantly polymerizing, adding um, these dimers, these tubulin dimers, and they are also constantly depolymerizing and taking off of the tubulin dimers. Um, and we can adjust these rates um, to either grow the microtubule, um, degrade the microtubule, or keep it at the same uh, the same length. Um, and that's why it's called dynamic equilibrium, because it's never stopping. We're always polymerizing and always dimerizing, but we can control those two rates um, and adjust um, the size of our microtubule. And that's basically how centrioles use microtubules um, during mitosis, which uh, is bullet point four. In animal cells, microtubules radiate outward from a central cell structure known as the centrosome. Um, so you're probably familiar uh, during metaphase, the uh, chromosomes are going to line up in the middle of the cell. Uh, we have those two centrioles that go to the uh, opposite ends of the cell, uh, and they use microtubules. The microtubules extend out, grab onto the middle of the chromosomes, and they drag them to the opposite sides of the cell in anaphase. So uh, microtubules are proteins that structure cilia and flagella, so it has to do a lot um, <clears throat> with movement. Uh, they play a huge role in cell division, like I just said. The microtubules form the mitotic spindle, um, and they separate sister chromatids, and they can also separate homologous pairs during uh, meiosis. Uh, microtubules may also aid the transport of cellular structure by acting as a path, which I thought was super interesting as well. So there are obviously complex networks of microtubules throughout your entire cytoskeleton. Um, so there are a lot of proteins that can take advantage of these and sort of use them as a highway. So if you look at the bottom left, um, this is a, mo a motor protein, or um, it's also known as a kinesin, um, and you could see it's carrying something along this microtubule. So it's actually using the microtubule um, to transport certain proteins um, throughout the cell. So uh, it's very complex. There are a lot of different structures and a lot of different uh, substances in the cell that can use these filaments to their, to their advantage. Um, so next up, we have microfilaments, uh, and these are filaments that are also created by the polymerization of actin, and they are designed to bear a lot of tension. So by coordinating with myosin, microfilaments help generate force uh, for cellular contraction, amoeboid movement, and the pinching of dividing cells during cytokinesis. So um, we were just talking about the microtubules that are pulling those chromosomes to the opposite sides of the cell. Um, during anaphase, and then we have telophase, where we are starting to form two separate cytoplasms. Um, and then during cytokinesis, we see that pinching right in the middle of the two cells. Uh, microfilaments will aid that pinching. Um, and in other cells, um, they allow for contraction and amoeboid movement, which um, is just very basic forms of movement. Um, and you can look right over here if you want to see a micrograph of an actual microfilament. Um, I'm sorry, I have an actual cell. Um, you can see the green are the microfilaments. Um, so they seem tense. They're very, um, very structured. Um, so G-actin versus F-actin. So the main component of microfilaments is actin. I'm sure you've heard of that protein before. Um, when we talk about muscles um, and action potentials, we often talk about actin and myosin in your muscle cells. Um, so microfilaments are um, the structural form of actin. So G-actin is the single globular form of the actin protein that is produced in cells. So it's produced in single monomers known as G-actin. Um, these G-actin monomers will polymerize into long helical chains referred to as filamentous actin or F-actin. So F-actin is what the microfilaments actually are. Um, since each monomer is connected to the next in the same orientation, um, they're all connected in the same orientation, um, these microfilaments exhibit polarity, so they're split into a positive and um, a negative end. 
So the positive end polymerizes and depolymerizes faster than the negative end. Um, <clears throat> not super important, but just something to keep in mind. Um, I just wanted to throw that on there so that you're familiar with all different types of microfilament behavior. Um, but the super important part of this slide is to know that microfilaments can come in two different forms. Um, G-actin polymerizes into F-actin, um, long helical chains known as F-actin, and then um, those are the building blocks for, micro for uh, microfilaments. Um, and then the third type we're talking about are intermediate filaments. So these are present in mammal cells, but not all eukaryotes. Intermediate filaments shape the cell and prevent fracturing under tension. So uh, these are really strong. They hold a lot of tension. Um, intermediate filament production begins with the folding of proteins into alpha helices, followed by polymerization into a thick, sturdy filament. So we're not starting with monomers. Um, we're not really starting with monomers um, polymerizing into long strands. Um, and we're not really readily polymerizing and depolymerizing. So intermediate filaments have a very high tensile strength and they are therefore the most stable structure in the cytoskeleton. So the other two filaments uh, can be sort of transient. Um, they're polymerizing, depolymerizing, moving around. Intermediate filaments are very static um, and they're very strong. So they're like the actual scaffolding, the actual backbone. Um, and they're very important to keeping the structure and shape of uh, eukaryotic cell. Um, they are nonpolar and they do not bind ATP or GTP. So they're very stable. Keep that in mind. Okay. Um, and we were just discussing the three main components. So just really quickly, uh, the cytoskeleton is basically uh, just what helps maintain the cell structure and its organization. Um, you can see from the diagram over here, the cytoskeleton is the um, on the inside of the cell membrane. It lines the cell membrane and that's what keeps, that's what gives the cell its, the, um, cell its shape. So the cytoskeleton can also help the cell with movement and cell division, depending on what type of cell it is. Um, and the main components of the cytoskeleton are the three filaments that we just learned about. Okay, review question number two. So which filaments below are prone to polymerizing and depolymerizing easily? Take a minute, um, read everything over, choose your answer. Uh, and when you are done, I will go over. Um, so pause the video. Okay, which filaments below are prone to polymerizing and depolymerizing easily? We have microtubules, micro, microfilaments, or intermediate filaments. Um, so the correct answer is D, microtubules and microfilaments. Uh, remember, microtubules um, polymerize and microfilaments also polymerize from monomers. Intermediate filaments don't. Um, they start with that protein that's folded into alpha helices, and then um, they polymerize initially into these big intermediate filaments, but they're not prone to polymerizing and depolymerizing. They are very stable structures. Uh, microfilaments and microtubules, however, do. Um, they do both polymerize and depolymerize. So uh, the correct answer here would be one and two. Uh, uh, that would be D. All right, so we're just about wrapped up. I'm gonna go, uh, this next section I'll go through really quickly. We're just reviewing um, some of the structures in the cell. This should all be reviewed to you guys, but I wanna go over it really quickly. Um, so the nucleus, obviously we have um, in most eukaryotic cells, genetic information is protected by a double membrane known as the nuclear envelope. Um, prokaryotic cells do not sequester their genetic information inside a nuclear membrane. So like bacteria, for example, they have plasmids. Um, you know, there are different ways that a cell can store its genetic information, but in eukaryotes, we like to sequester it safely inside the nuclear envelope um, so that we can carry our function safely inside there away from all of the, you know, degradation that occurs in the cytoplasm, for example. Um, so the nucleus contains machinery for replication and transcription of DNA um, and the splicing of RNA. So the translation of mRNA occurs in the cytoplasm. So remember, if we're transcribing DNA, we're making that mRNA, it leaves the nucleus, um, after being spliced, of course, and then um, translation occurs in the cytoplasm of the ribosomes. Um, and it's also, it's not pictured here, but it's worth mentioning um, of the structure known as the nucleolus, which uh, is located inside the nucleus. It, nucleolus actually means little nucleus, and that's what it kind of looks like. It just looks like a little dot. It's not present in this diagram, um, but you just have to know that it produces ribosomes. It's basically a ribosome factory, um, and it's located inside the nucleus as well. So we have some ribosomes. Um, they are not bound by membranes. So technically they're not considered organelles, um, but they are super important structures for um, 
<clears throat> in all cells basically. Um, so it's the site of protein translation um, and it's in the cytoplasm. Um, and I say cytoplasm um, because I'm contrasting from the nucleus. Um, it's, there are also ribosomes that are on the profendoplasmic reticulum. Um, so they may be free in the cytoplasm, uh, cytoplasm or attached to the RER. So RER ribosomes produce proteins that usually end up with the following fates. Um, they usually secreted from the cell, they become a cell membrane protein, they become a Golgi, lysosome, or an ER protein. So when they're made in the ER, um, they're usually on that path, they'll go to the Golgi, they're usually being packaged for something to be sent to another structure um, or to be secreted from the cell. Uh, free cytoplasmic ribosomes make proteins that are usually headed toward peroxisomes, toward the mitochondria, um, the nucleus, or will stay in the cytoplasm. So the rough endoplasmic reticulum is a system of folded membranes that gets um, its rough appearance from the presence of ribosomes. So it's in the cytoplasm, but these ribosomes are sort of studded on the walls of the endoplasmic reticulum. And that's why we call it rough, because it looks rough. Um, and the rough endoplasmic reticulum, uh, it synthesizes proteins, proteins from membranes and export uh, from the cell. It's also continuous with um, the nucleus. So a lot of things that come out of the nucleus will pass through the rough endoplasmic reticulum uh, without ever actually being in the free cytoplasm. Uh, so proteins will often move from the rough endoplasmic reticulum directly to the Golgi where it is packaged into membranous vesicles. So um, it's sort of like a conveyor belt from the nucleus to the ER, um, and then it goes from the ER to the Golgi. Uh, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, you can see it looks a little bit different. It's still the same thing. Um, it's um, just a system of membranous sacs, basically. Um, it's folded membranes, excuse me, but it does lack the ribosome concentration of the rough ER. So uh, because it doesn't have ribosomes, it's not actively involved in protein processing, uh, but it does play a role in steroid synthesis, for example, in the gonads. Um, and it can also aid in the degradation of toxins in the cell. Um, so Golgi that are in liver cells will help, um, will help purify the toxins in that cell. Um, and you can see they're right next to each other same membranes, um, just there are no ribosomes on these smooth ER. Then we have the Golgi apparatus, also known as the Golgi bodies, or uh, most simply just the Golgi. Um, and those are a group of membranous sacs located outside of the endoplasmic reticulum. Um, sometimes people liken them to a stack of pancakes, um, anything like that. It's just sort of like a smashed stack of folded membranes. Um, so the Golgi may modify proteins from the ER, they may sort proteins, um, to send to specific final destinations, and they can also synthesize certain macromolecules like polysaccharides. Um, proteins coming out of the ER, the endoplasmic reticulum, remember, will enter the Golgi from the cis phase, travel unidirectionally through the membranes, and exit out of the trans phase toward the cell membrane. So um, when things move through the Golgi apparatus, it is usually unidirectional. There are certain examples um, of where proteins move the opposite direction um, in a retrograde fashion. Um, but for the most part, everything that is working normally is moving unidirectionally um, through the Golgi apparatus from the cis face to the trans. Um, and you can remember trans means across. So if you ever, if you're ever confused between which is cis and which is trans, just remember that the cis is the one that is facing the entry of the protein, which is toward the endoplasmic reticulum. The trans face is across from where the protein is entering. So it has to cross the Golgi to get to the transphase, which means across. Um, so remember, the transphase is facing outward. Then we have the mitochondria. Um, so mitochondria are small organelles composed of an inner and outer membrane um, and are the site of oxidative phosphorylation. So while the inner membrane is impermeable, impermeable excuse me, to the diffusion of polar substances, the outer membrane has large pores and is not very selective. Uh, the inner membrane, the site of the electron transport chain, is folded into structures called cristae, which increase the surface area. So you can see the cristae right here. Um, and you could see they're folded. Uh, that's the inner membrane. And then the outer membrane is uh, a lot more smooth. Uh, it's not folded. Um, so mitochondria possess their own genome. Um, the endosymbiotic theory is not something you need to know too much about, but um, it's just the theory that states that mitochondria were once most likely um, individual prokaryotic organisms that were taken up by a larger organism. Um, and there's a lot of evidence for the theory, um, one being that uh, mitochondria exhibit their own genome. Um, 
they have this double membrane. The inner membrane uh, sort of looks very familiar to gram-negative bacteria. Um, so it's very likely that if these were budding out of another organism, that second membrane was formed around it um, due to you know a situation like that. Uh, but you don't know have you don't have to know too much about endosymbiotic theory. Um, just know that that's an explanation for why the mitochondria is sort of a little bit different from the rest of the organelles, uh, specifically because it does have its own genome. Um, and because it has its own genes, uh, the mitochondria, they exhibit complete maternal inheritance. Um, so when the sperm fertilizes the egg, all of the mitochondria that that um, eventual organism will have come from that egg, come from the cytoplasm in the egg, because um, the cytoplasm in the eventual body comes from the mother cell, um, and so do all of the mitochondria. So the next structure um, we're going to talk about are the centrioles. Uh, centrioles are a barrel-shaped structure uh, that play an important part in cell division. So if you look to the right, you'll see um, they do sort of look uh, like little barrels. Um, so when the cell enters mitosis, the centrioles are responsible for creating microtubules that make up the mitotic spindle. We just spoke a little bit uh, about that microtubules before. Paracentrioles will move up to the poles of a dividing cell and pull apart the sister chromatid pairs um, to begin anaphase. So as you can see right over there, these mitotic spindles are moving to the poles and they're going to pull them apart. Um, and that's basically the main function of centrioles. That's definitely what you need to know them for. Okay, and then we have one final review and we are finished for the day. So in which of the following places would you most likely not find a ribosome? Uh, take a minute, pause the video, um, unpause when you're ready. Okay, so in which of the following places would you most likely not find a ribosome? So the correct answer is B, the smooth ER. Um, the nucleolus, as we mentioned before, is a ribosome factory. That's where they're produced. Uh, the rough ER is the location of many, the final location of many ribosomes. They, they're studded on the walls of the rough ER and they produce proteins there. Um, and D, we also have a bunch of ribosome, rib, ribosomes, excuse me, floating around freely in the cytoplasm as well. So you would find them there. Um, the only place you wouldn't find them uh, is the smooth ER. And we call it the smooth ER specifically because of the absence of ribosomes. It gives that, uh, that membrane a smoother look. Um, so B would be the correct answer for that one. Uh, again, if you guys have any questions about anything I said, uh, any, um, any of my review questions that we went over, if you have any questions, any corrections like that, please feel free to email me. Um, you can use that Calendly link as well from the beginning. Um, and you can, you, know, you can sign up. We do 30 minute tutoring sessions, one-on-one -on -one, uh, office hours. So I am free for those as well. Um, other than that, that is pretty much all of the content that we have for this week. Um, so happy studying and, um, tune in next week for some more content. All right, guys, have a good one.